I'm very pleased to attend this historic conference and delighted to have been given the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker, the Chair of Transparency International, Dr. Huguette Labelle, a world-renowned champion in the fight against corruption. Those of us who work in the public sector, in particular, understand how important it is to be aware of the application of anti-corruption measures to every area of our work. None know this better than Dr. Labelle, a former Canadian civil servant and academic. She's a key figure in the global ch charge to eradicate corruption. Writing recently in the Huffington Post, she stated that corruption is inimical to development as it negatively impacts a government's ability to meet the needs of its people. She has also revealed some key findings from her organization, most recent review or, perce or perceived corruption levels in the global public sector. Two thirds of the 177 countries scored less than 50 on a scale, scored less than 50 on a scale where 100 is considered clean. Arguing that even low level of, of corruption derail the fight against poverty, Ms. LaBelle urges zero tolerance. She also calls for international cooperation to make good governance a part of the, the post-2015 Millennium Development Agenda. Her qualifications and background make her uniquely qualified to assess these matters. She has a Master's of Education and a Doctor of Philosophy Education degree from the University of Ottawa. She is a member of the board of the UN Global Compact, the group of in external advisors on the World Bank governance and anti-corruption strategy. The advisor group to the Asian Development Bank on climate change and sustainable development, the executive board of the African Capacity Building Foundation, the advisory council of the Order of Ontario, vice chair of the senior advisor board of the International Anti-Corruption Academy and was the chancellor of the University of Ottawa. During her many years of distinguished public service, she had received numerous awards, including the Order of Canada in 2001, Order of the Red Cross in 2005, for being, for being the first woman president of the Canadian Red Cross, and the Order of Ontario. Additionally, she has been awarded no less than 10 honorary degrees from universities such as Notre, Notre Dame, York University, and St. Paul's University. Contemporary wisdom on leadership indicates that the primary role of any effective leader is to be the chief conversation facilitator. In that regard, it is difficult to think of anyone more eminently qualified to set the tone for the next three days of this conference, in which our goal is to establish a path towards a corruption-free Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, Please give a warm Caribbean welcome to Dr. Hewlett Lobel. Thank you for these very kind words, uh, Your Highness, uh, Excellency, honorable members, Chief Justice, Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Premier, if you said you had trouble with all the people before you, you can imagine what I've got. <laughs> huge trouble, huge trouble. But I would like, like many of you, to congratulate UCCI. Uh, I think that you have now set a, a path for the future, and there will be another one in two years from now and in four years from now, because I think you have started something here, and Trevor, it's great. Uh, to have you uh, here as well. But thank you to the sponsors, because these events do not happen by chance, and it's great that, that we have that. When I saw the, the young people, the, the first group the, with the drummers, I was reminded of something that happened to me many years ago. Um, I was Deputy Minister of Transport, uh, which is a big department, and every year, uh, the head of the union and I would have a joint accountability to as many of the 35,000 staff who were in the capital. And uh, so I decided to challenge him and say, next year, we 
each one of us, the two of us, will learn a new instrument, a new musical instrument. I played the piano more or less at that time, but I said, you know, I can't do that. So I figured the drums are going to be easy. So I said, I'm going to play the drums, and what are you going to play? So you know, I came out. So I, my son had a friend who was a very good drummer. So he brought all his drumming equipment, and I used to call them the super drums, the sub drums, because they have so many things. And I tried. And when you have one hand doing one thing, the other hand doing another, one foot on one side, the other foot, I mean, it's very difficult. But I was saved because six months before that meeting that was going to happen the following year, the prime minister asked me to please take over the Canadian International Development Agency. So <laughs> I, was, I was out <laughs> and saved. Um, this, this conference is so very important, and so is the Caribbean. We have many countries in this part of the world. The size may not be that of India, but each country at the table of nations counts, and each country in this part of the world counts. So, you know, we, we are now looking at a very globalized world which seems to turn in a constant series of crises, which we could do without, but they're there. And they're in real time on internet 24-7. Uh, and so it's important uh, that this conference be able to take stock, to consider what are some of the underlying reasons that create these disturbances uh, around the world. And of course, what we can do about them, what we can do to prevent as well as to deal with them. Um, and one of the major contributing factors is corruption, whether we start with the uh, um, issues that happened in the Gulf countries, the Arab Spring, whether we're talking of Ukraine now, South Sudan, and we can go around the world. And we must remember that no country is immune, unfortunately, to suddenly a spark starting something. So the, the need for our leaders, for our managers, and those who deliver services to our people to anchor their work on a strong set of ethical values is more important than ever. And this applies to both the public and private sectors but it starts with each one of us as individuals also. Corruption today, and you mentioned a number of you spoke about that, corruption today continues to take a great toll on our societies, and it threatens to exacerbate some of the wider challenges that we face in the years to come. Whether these are extreme poverty, inequality of income, which we have in all of our countries today, um, environmental issues, delivering of public services to all citizens, maintaining peace and stability. I think that corruption takes a center place to make sure that these are not exacerbated. Because corruption strikes very hard, particularly at those most vulnerable. I don't like to use the term petty corruption because, you know, you have the big corruption, people who steal billions of dollars from a country. And then you have the petty corruption, which is people who have to pay uh, the police because they haven't done anything, but the police stop them. And I'm not talking of Cayman Islands here. Uh, or, or they have to bribe in order to get their child looked at because the child is very ill and you could go on to gain access to electricity, and so on. But if your annual income of your family is $600 US, and as we learned in one of our major people survey, you have to pay 40% of that in bribes in order to access essential services, it's not petty, it's big. 
because very little is left for the rest uh, of the family. And we, we do a, a, what we call a people's survey. It's the uh, global corruption parameter. The last one, uh, we, um, this, it was a survey of 117,000 people uh, in 107 countries, where we ask very specific questions. Did you have to pay a bribe last year? To whom? And we list about 12 services um, that are essential. And in that survey, the average is that uh, one uh, out of four people said they had to bribe in order to access essential services. That seems pretty bad, 25%. But in some countries, it's three out of four who have to bribe to gain access to essential services. And these are not the very rich countries, unfortunately. And we were looking at maternal mortality and compared it, we correlated it to our corruption perception index. And in countries where more than 60% say that they have to bribe in order to access essential services, 482 women out of 100,000 die giving childbirth. In countries where less than 30% said that they had to bribe to gain access to essential services, 57 women died at childbirth out of 100,000. And in some of our countries, it's two or three out of 100,000. So, you know, it gives us a very good example. WHO just published recently one of their own surveys where they indicate that every year, about 700,000 people die just of malaria and tuberculosis because of counterfeit medication which is something that is no longer just being s tried to be sold in developing countries, but around the world, so it can touch all of us somewhere uh, along the way. So that's why I keep saying corruption is not just a question of money, bad enough, but it's also, it's also a question that corruption kills. It kills if a building crumbles because the inspectors looked the other way uh, when they were bribed, and we could go on. But it's also not just an issue of uh, the public sector and the people, but businesses also um, have some difficulties. And in some countries, if a business wants to start a new business, um, what we did in one of our surveys, we found that one person in five had to pay bribes to register the company, to seek a permit, uh, have land services, and more than one in 10 had to bribe regarding utilities, tax, and customs. So, you know, it touches the people, but it touches business sector uh, as well. Um, and what we find, unfortunately, is that in some countries, those institutions that are fundamental to the safety of the people, that is the judiciary and the police, are seen in those countries uh, as sometimes the most vulnerable to corruption after political parties. I go back to your point earlier, Mr. Premier, where uh, the, in, in half of the countries that we interviewed, that where the survey was done on the barometer that I mentioned earlier, that is 57 countries, the um, political parties were perceived to be the most vulnerable uh, to, to corruption. So corruption deals or creates poverty and keeps people poor. But it also destroys the trust uh, in leaders and in institutions. Uh, of the state. And what happens is that very often the failure of leaders to tackle corruption uh, can become a self-fulfilling spiral when people no longer take commitments seriously, although they might be made seriously, but the people uh, over time decide that this cannot be serious. And we know today that elections are won and lost on the issue of corruption, and that those who profit from corruption can be a barrier to reformers who come into power. So you can have a political party 
a leader uh, of a political party come into power with great determination in a country which has high in corruption to really clean up um, the institutions and the services to the public. But very soon, uh, the active forces that benefit in the, have benefited in the past from corruption take over and create so much pressure that it becomes extremely difficult for those leaders to be able to have the courage to continue. And this is why I say uh, this is when all of us have to continue to support uh, the agenda that was set, set by these leaders. And I'm often told by presidents of countries, by prime ministers, if I do not have the people of my country, if I do not have civil society business pushing me to continue with the agenda that I have, pushing my government, I have so many other people pushing me the other way that it's just a one-way street. And therefore, we need, we need this, this uh, support. I think another area where a vulnerability uh, when you have corruption is that it keeps investors away. And uh, there is much evidence to suggest, indeed, that investors would rather not operate where there is a risk of corruption. And in a survey of more than 390 senior business leaders, almost 45% said that corruption risks led them to either stay out of a country or leave a country. Uh, because it was just uh, too risky for them to do business there. Of course, another big issue in terms of what corruption causes is that it takes away the assets of a country uh, and very often this stolen money is laundered and there is a, quite an interesting nexus between stolen of assets, stealing of assets, money laundering, and illicit trade. And very often, illicit trade uh, in arms and drugs, which comes back to bite those same countries and institutions where the initial uh, money was stolen. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, a two, two, 2009 estimate uh, uh, indicates that um, about 180 million billion, I'm sorry, 180 billion U.S. dollars uh, has been stolen uh, by uh, leaders in, from developing countries. And I'm not pointing the finger at developing countries because if you steal money, and you have to hide it somewhere, and the West has been very prominent in accommodating that without and looked the other way. Um, or did not do the due diligence sufficiently well. And that's, of course, the tip of the iceberg because we know that corruption is opaque, it's under the table, and therefore we don't really know what is the extent of the money that's been stolen. But one thing that uh, is becoming increasingly better known is the whole issue of tax evasion, uh, which uh, you mentioned, uh, you're on earlier. Um, and I guess the financial crisis brought the world to its knees, especially the developing world and the major industrial uh, in countries. Um, and basically, they began to realize how much, uh, how many, how much of their own resources were uh, out of their country uh, through tax evasion. And uh, the, you know, the the. Um, the, the, justice, the Tax Justice Network estimates that about three trillion a year, uh, it's costing uh, economies around the world about three trillion a year uh, in tax evasion. And they also estimate that there's about 32 trillion uh, that may be hidden by individuals outside of their countries. Uh, and that's about twice the GDP of the United States. So it's not petty cash, it's a lot of money. Um, and I'd just like to say a few words uh, about the, uh, the criminal organizations, that is drug cartels, terror networks, which uh, are very much part of this corrupt net set of network. 
and they are now able to move their resources and operations across borders almost with impunity. Through high technology, a click of the mouse can rapidly change who is the owner of the resources and complicit networks. And because sometimes of weak regulatory regimes in countries or bad enforcement or poor enforcement, um, these resources disappear very quickly. Um, I spent a few days at Interpol to better understand what was happening, how money was moving. And I got pretty scared after these two days to see uh, how easy uh, it has become, uh, especially with technology, to be able to hide uh, stolen resources. Um, and these uh, groups have the resources to push back. So when a country wants to establish new regimes, new legislation, new regulation, new institutions, or strengthen the institutions, uh, they will pull back with everything they've got to try to prevent that um, from happening. And it comes at a very high cost because the scale of illicit trade is such that, of course, it undermines national institutions. Uh, organized crime cartels grow to be so powerful that they challenge official government institutions, they create criminal patronage networks sustained by bribery and intimidation, and institute parallel governance structures. I have had uh, a number of uh, heads of countries who have told me where, where the drug uh, trade is very high, and it's not just Latin America now. It's everywhere, it's in Africa, it's in South Asia, and so on. But they have told me that their greatest concern is that the sophistication is such that they are infiltrating state institutions, the judiciary even, uh, the, agenda, the, the state government, um, the local municipal government where they place all their individuals and therefore it makes it much easier for them to launder their money and really uh, to take over uh, and become in a sense that have more power than the elected leaders of the countries. And then you can really talk about state capture when that does happen. And of course, parliament, parliamentary committees might also be under that radar and uh, where they would, um, those networks would try to influence, of course, decisions um, by parliaments uh, around the world. Now, I could go on and speak at great length about the problems of corruption, uh, but I just you know, want to move on, hoping that I have uh, discouraged you completely um, at this time. But um, I'm an optimist, and I think that we can have a different future, uh, that we can prevent corruption and deal with it. Well, and to me, it's, I believe that people in our countries do not wish to see their institutions, both state and private, being complicit to fraud and to criminal activity. The country I think that our people believe in is one that's open, that's free, that is safe, that is just, with a decent quality of life for everyone, with a clean private sector, with educational institutions that prepare their graduates to have a strong moral compass in their professional and their private lives, and countries where corruption is a rare exception by a few rogue individuals, because it will happen sometime. So how do we achieve this? I think my first point is to say that leadership matters people who are in leadership positions, both in the public and private sector, uh, are key to setting the tone, to ensuring that their institutions become value-driven and that they do not look the other way. They ensure that they have the systems in place that will make the difference and that the people in their organizations will want to do what is right. So I start with leadership. 
And I move immediately, Chief Justice, to the rule of law. Uh, because we know that if we do not have that, then everything is very shaky. We are not protected. There are two sets of laws, one for those who are rich or who are criminal gangs, and the rest of the people. And some never get to be convicted, whereas others do. And you know, so the, the importance, especially of the judiciary, and I don't want to diminish the role of the police far from it, or prosecutors, but the role of the judiciary in, in setting that foundation and ensuring that people are treated in front of the law in a fair way, in an open way. And that means that we have a judiciary which is fully independent. Not one, as a president from a country to be unnamed, told me when I was speaking with him and I was saying, Mr. President, you do realize how important the judiciary is and how in independent it is and how properly resourced it must be. And, and he said, oh, of course I do. I have, located right outside, I have located them right outside of my office on the same floor that I occupy because I believe so much that they're very important. Uh, so uh, I guess he had missed the point, uh, obviously. But the way that justices are, are um, appointed, are promoted, uh, justices are removed, if that is the necessary, um, I think is so important in our countries. And I was very interested to hear how you do it here. And in a number of Caribbean countries who are in the British system. And that is so important because it doesn't work like that in many countries, I can tell you that. So I think this is a, a point to, to keep in mind and one that hopefully you will promote outside of your borders uh, because I think it would be very good for many other countries to see how it is done in your countries here. Uh, but when I, I say independent, professional, um, and uh, open, in other words, that, that the, um, not only do you have the decisions public, but the proceedings as much as possible, unless there's very special reasons not to. But at the same time, uh, they need to be properly resourced so that it doesn't take 20 years or 15 years in order to arrive at a conviction. And that is where it can be a problem. Now, let me move to parliaments. They're also very important and need to show the way. And uh, Mr. Premier, you were speaking about that as well in your comments. And, you know, it is essential, of course, that parliamentarians have a code of conduct to set the standards to what is permissible, what is not. That they, um, they have, uh, as well, um, public disclosure of their assets and those of their immediate family. Again, uh, a country not to be named, um, the president of that country's two sons of one 10 and one 12 years old, each were the owners of a multi-million uh, condo in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so that family does matter without any question. Uh, and, you know, to be able, if as, as um, ministers and so on, to be able to place their affairs in uh, a fully arm's length blind trust, but not a blind trust which is under the direction of the spouse or the children. That's not quite blind, in, I think, in most people's views. Uh, so that there is, you know, conflict of interest is avoided and uh, that uh, the parliamentarians are not seen to be doing what is right for their company as opposed to what is right for the people of their countries. I think there are some countries that are also, um, and I don't know what is happening in the Caribbean to tell you the truth on that front, but of course voting on laws and rules uh, has to be aimed at the public good and not at those who contributed to the uh, elections of parties and individuals, so that the onus is on decision makers to publish interest groups who contribute to decisions. And now we have, in many countries, they have taken steps to regulate not just the political party campaign financing, and I'll come back to that, but also 
have developed a, a register and they publish what they call legislative footprints. And that is, they document who gives input into laws over the table and under the table uh, with public registers, of course, of lobbyists. And that, I think, is very important. But the whole financing of political parties, I think, is where sometimes is what builds a lot of distrust by the people. Um, and, you know, here we're not just talking about ensuring that all contributions uh, are made public, uh, all contributions to candidates, to political parties are public, that the expenditures are also public during the election uh, so that people can see both. Um, and a number of countries, of course, well, in addition that you have external auditors auditing these in real time, not a year later, so that this is made public independently by uh, good external auditors, and sometimes it could be by a strong electoral commission, or it could be the auditor general of a country. It varies, but as long as it is independent and done in a timely way and in a full way, I think this is important. Now, some countries, um, including mine and Canada, has abolished the capacity for any organization to contribute to political parties. In other words, the private sector cannot, unions cannot, any organization, only individuals. And that's an interesting approach, and I know that many businesses in Canada were very pleased because they had to give money to each political party, not knowing which one would get into power very often, and it became very costly, or um, they decided to put their money under one uh, can, one uh, political party, which of course didn't make it, etc. So, uh, so that's an interesting question. I'm not suggesting it has to be like this everywhere, but it does it does create, I think, somewhat greater trust. And the other one is the capping, capping of donations. Um, in Canada right now, our cap is $1,200 for per individual per campaign. Um, now the current government is putting a bill in front of the House to raise it to 1500 because they want to abolish. There was also uh, a certain amount per vote that came from the public funds. It was a small amount in total. They decided they wanted to abolish this and they're raising uh, the individual contributions to $1,500 uh, per individual. But it's more the combination of full transparency, good external auditor, strong electoral commission, properly resourced in do, terms to do their work, and of course then uh, these other aspects of capping and uh, leaving the uh, contributions to individuals alone I think is something that each country may look at differently. Uh, I'd like to move, and I'm conscious of the time, so some of you have been sitting for a very long time here, um, to the public sector which is who delivers on a day-to-day -day the regulations, their enforcement, the services to the public, um, where in many countries um, over 50% of the budget is on uh, procurement and construction, the two big hotspots for corruption, high vulnerability here. Um, so. I think when I used to be chairman of the Public Service Commission in Canada for a number of years, and to me, the, the entry into the public service and the promotion into the public service has to be on a very strict merit basis. Because otherwise, you do, this is when the people begin to lose faith, in, not just in political leaders, which of course you hope they would not, that that would not be an issue, but also in the institutions of the government and in the public sector as well. So that it starts there, but it also starts also with themselves having a code of ethics, which is strong, and not just on paper, but lived, and where people are trained to know what it means to live by such high standards. And where the declaration of asset, disclosure of assets as well, and where finance 
all the money coming into the government, the money that is dispersed. So that's the other big area, the financial sector, to make sure that that is fully transparent. And it's a very interesting case in Brazil where um, they have decided a few years ago that by 12 midnight every day, all the revenues to the government, by whom and how much, and all that is paid by the government, to whom, how much, and for what purpose, had to be online. So it's on the web every day. And that's a very interesting, it's one of the few countries that I know, if not the only one, that does it on a daily basis. And they said, Leo, once we establish a system, it's not so complicated because the information has to be there. And now the only thing they want to do is make sure that it's not, uh, that it's not just a question that accountants can understand it, but that it's simple, really available uh, to the people. So which brings me to the fact that having good legislation on access to information seen as a right, not a privilege for the people, uh, that governments, all of us, I've been there long enough, realize that when uh, that information belongs to the people, it is the people's information, it's not the government's information, and we're just the custodian of it, uh, and that the general rule should be that information is public, that is transparent, that people don't have to be on their knees begging to have information that belongs to them to start with. Um, of course, there are certain areas where you need to keep the information protected. And questions of national security, some aspects of privacy, but it should be written clearly in the law because otherwise it stretches. Everything becomes national security or everything becomes privacy and nothing is available or very little is available. So one has to be very cautious in this case. I'd just like to say a few words about procurement um, because there are scandals everywhere perhaps not in your countries, but certainly in many of the countries I know in, in, in the West as well as in the South, um, about collusion, uh, about bribery to get contracts, um, about extortion along the way. And here what you have is the nexus between the private and the public sector hits very hard. Uh, in when you have procurement taking place or construction. There's an estimate that from now until 2030, there'll be about 50 trillion needed in construction for infrastructure alone. And even if it doesn't quite hit the 50 trillion, if it's only 40, if 10% of that is lost to corruption, it's not petty cash, it's a lot of money. And what you have in return, I think, is uh, less infrastructure, yet the people have paid for it, but they're not getting it. And the World Bank estimates that sometimes it's up to 40% that is lost. And so, you know, what those who are, are working hard at preventing corruption in those sectors, what they do, of course, is they use e-procurement. They use online procurement, and from the setting of the specifications right to the end, it is there for people to see. And of course, if the specifications are so narrow that there's only one company that can win, people can ask questions. Or if the time of the bidding is four weeks when this is a mega project, again, people can start asking questions. Uh, but that's not the only thing that one needs to do. And Transparency International has developed what we're calling integrity packs, where the bidders and the one asking for the bids um, are, um, in, a sen in a sense, in a, a written agreement um, that there will not be bribery. And if there is, if anyone is caught bribing, they're disqualified and sometimes pay a fine as well. And the other aspect, of course, is on big projects where you have what we call a social witness program, where there is a full monitoring along the whole project by independent forensic auditors, engineers, depending on what it is that, that you're building, not just looking at the paper. That can be, you know, could be a lot of fudging with paper, uh, but at actually what takes place. Uh, Mexico has introduced that social witness program. They've done about 60 billion worth of it, and they feel that they have saved billions of dollars as a result. Um, I would just like to say one quick word uh, about, and by the way, I. 
I understand that uh, I want to say a few words about oversight institutions. And here I'm talking of Auditors General, Anti-Corruption Commission, Ombudsman, and some might have different names, and how important those are uh, in our societies. They're part of building an integrity system and with checks and balances, providing independent assessment, and to help the uh, people in the country to hold their leaders accountable, but hopefully also to help the institutions to clean up certain aspects that they may not have been aware of that were problematic. And, uh, and you know, in certain countries, anti-corruption commissions or their equivalent um, have uh, also uh, prosecuting responsibilities over and above investigations uh, and receiving complaints. And I understand that Jamaica has a, 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 a law in front of parliament right now uh, which has that in it, which is quite, quite interesting. Uh, as, but you know, again, these institutions, like the judiciary, have to be independent. They have to be resourced. They have to be professional. Otherwise, they can't do their work. In terms of the private sector, um, it not only takes two to tango, it takes three sometimes, and it's very awkward to do the tango with three, but you know, you need the, the, the ones who pay, the ones who ask, and the facilitators in between. But the private sector, I think, is so important. And we still have businesses who feel that the way to do business is to bribe. Um, but many leaders of industries, I think, are, have come to the conclusion that it's not the way to do work and that they become victims because they now, as more and more anti-bribery legislation exists around the world, uh, they, it's much harder to hide uh, if a bribe is being paid. Uh, and therefore, they realize that they can be, uh, uh, you know, investigated if, they, if, it's a, if it's a project of the World Bank, they will be debarred from the World Bank for years to come. Uh, they can hand, land in jail and they can lose their business. But hopefully many of them are not motivated by those negative factors, but by the fact that they want a clean company because they know that their staff will be much more proud to work in such a company and they will be more loyal and they will not do to the company what the company is doing outside. You know, they will be respecting this. And so more and more companies are coming together and united because one company, if it's a very big one, can do a lot in influencing what happens in a country or countries around the world. But coming together makes a big difference. And we see sometimes in a country where a number of industries, industry leaders, will come together and go to the agency of government which has been creating a problem. It could be customs. And they say, listen, we're not ready to live with this having to pay bribes to get stuff of customs anymore. But we're ready to help you. We're ready to help build e-payment. We're ready to make sure that uh, this is fixed and, and it does. Um, you mentioned, Governor, uh, earlier um, two of the points that are happening globally. So it's not just in our countries because we know that corruption is a global issue and countries between each other uh, are very important. And what happens in one has an impact on the others. And there are two things that you raised, which to me I'd just like to stress, which are so important. And that is the new um, understanding or the new uh, realization uh, of the automatic exchange of information as a global standard which was uh, presented in February and uh, will be finalized in mid-2014 and be approved by the end of the year for implementation in all countries, in, in as hopefully not just the G20, because that's the G20, but in countries around the world. And that is to have multilateral exchange of information. It takes decades to do bilateral agreements one after another for all countries. And when you have a multilateral exchange of information on tax and other issues, finance, then it is much easier to be able to find money that's been stolen uh, or tax evaded and also to proceed with the justice system uh, in its own. And the other one is the beneficial ownership. 
because a new place to hide money is in equity, in companies, and in subsidiaries. And therefore, the uh, G8 uh, approving uh, last year uh, in, in, London, in the UK um, that uh, beneficial ownership information should be in public registry, registers and available for all. And that touches hopefully not just the company, uh, but also the subsidiaries of, of the companies because it's a new place to uh, hide resources. Finally, I'd just like to say a few words about a very important section, which is education. Uh, and we are in such a wonderful educational institution here at UCCI. And to me, this is where it starts. Of course, it starts with parents, but it starts in building in our educational institution the kind of ethics uh, that will make the leaders of tomorrow the people of tomorrow, people that will turn their back on corruption, people that will want to do what is right. And it starts at primary level and moves right on to PhD level. And um, just two or three quick examples. Uh, in uh, our chapter in Chile a number of years ago, brought together psychopedagogues, teachers, artists, producers, uh, to take grade three students and develop a program for a whole year with an hour a week. And so what they did was to develop a set of um, uh, a, a real program, but based on, on uh, it looked like play actually, it looked like uh, you were playing a game uh, and where the children were really faced with a moral issue and they had to discover what it was, but also to see what they would do to fix it. And, uh, and we have a number of chapters around the world who are working at different levels, developing, uh, in, developing tools for education, uh, both for media, for internet, but for the classroom. And the education system as a whole is where p young people are for more than half sometimes of their wake up day. They spend a lot of time there, and it can be tremendously powerful. And I don't believe that young people are our future only. They are present. And we saw that this evening, in the kind of talent that we have, the kind of energy that young people have, and their capacity to make a difference. And we also have chapters who have developed, for example, in Bangladesh, what they're calling Youth for Integrity, close to 5,000 young people across the country are working in their communities, identifying where are the issues that need to be, but also working at finding solutions, at bringing other people with them, because again, uh, alone is not so easy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we've talked all evening um, about the importance of ethics, uh, the danger of corruption, how much of a disease it is, and with all disease, we have to work fast. We can't say it's a long-term issue. It's a short-term issue and one that we need to work. But that at the end of the day, it is the individual people that will make the difference. It's all of us. Uh, all of us individually and all of us bringing others along with us. And here we're talking of civil society, we're talking of the education system, we're talking of business, we're talking of governments sitting at the same table uh, to ensure that we have the best for our people and that we have institutions that are strong, that are clean, that are highly ethical. And you know, the energy that we have in this evening that we saw this evening, the energy that we have in the Caribbean, the resilience of the people, um, the fortitude, I think means that this can be tackled. And um, it's been a long time, but change will come, we heard this evening. And we also heard we will not tolerate corruption. And that's what I would like to leave you with this evening. Thank you very much.
Thank you very, very much, Huguette, for those words of encouragement, those imparting of so much information and knowledge and experience from so many countries around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know where you're going, but the evening is not yet over. Um, may I invite you to pause for a moment and to not only reflect on what has been said, but in an academic environment, we always welcome questions, comments, uh, disagreements, and of course challenges to the mission that we have, combating corruption, enhancing ethics and values. So I'd like to invite those of you who may have a concern or raise an issue or question that might not have been covered, the hour is late, but nevertheless, you may have the opportunity so to do. While waiting on anyone who may have such a question, I just wanted to encourage you to take a look at your program and to see the real feast of presentations that lie ahead of you. In particular, I want to draw your attention to tomorrow morning, the plenary session, where we will have the keynote address by the Dr. The Honorable Ngozi Okonha Awela, Minister of Finance of Nigeria, herself a former director of the World Bank. She's going to be speaking on the Nigerian experience, lessons for the Caribbean. And of course, no country, very few countries are more qualified to speak about combating corruption than Nigeria, which for such a long time and to a large extent at the present time remains very much in combat mode. So, are there any questions, any concerns, uh, Lloyd? Lloyd Waller, may, may, may I ask you to identify yourself so oh, that the rest uh, of us uh, may is, know? Um, I'm Lloyd Waller, I'm a, the, a lecturer at the University of the West Indies and the head of the, uni of the Department of Government and also the director for the Center for Leadership and Governance, the birthplace of Naya. Um, I have a question. My area of research, one of my areas of research is e-governance and, and, and within the context of e-governance and governance broadly, looking at accountability and transparency, um, information and communication technology for combating corruption. And you said earlier that um, there was a bit of a concern with the ease of which um, monies are transferred globally using ICTs, but I'm also wondering, being familiar with the technologies themselves, isn't it also easier to track the activities because they all have to go through a server with IP addresses which are all traceable? Uh, that's one. The second question to ask is, it, it, more and more we are now migrating to an online space. One can only imagine what the world would look like 10 years from now. Um, what is Transparency International doing to keep up with the pace at which um, these emerging ICTs are being used as tools to facilitate corruption? May I make a suggestion that to the extent that there may be other persons who have questions or comments, maybe we'll take two to give an opportunity for those who have been sitting so long to uh, make their observations, and then, Hugh I'm sure you'll want to comment on what Lloyd had asked you. Can you go next section? Yeah, go right ahead. Is there another mic? In, uh, yes, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Paulino Rodriguez. I work for the Cayman Islands Silver Service. And my question is for Dr. LaBelle. Uh, it regards your uh, organization rankings, the rankings that you do on the perception of corruption. I want to know if you can give us some clarification on what are the factors that make Northern European countries so high up in those rankings. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have other questions, but I'll leave that for another sure. occasion. Okay. okay. Uh, well, let me start with this last uh, uh, question because it's one that's very often asked. And um, when you're looking at the Nordic countries, uh, you're looking at countries that are not very large to start with. So, you know, there's some comparability. 
uh, but you've got very robust justice system, uh, very robust social systems as well. People pay quite heavy taxes in those countries, but expect to have good services, and they do. They get, you know, good services. Um, and so you've got also openness. Uh, people know what is happening. Uh, and uh, some of it is because the country is not large and therefore, but also it's because of, of the culture uh, within government of uh, being much more, more open than many other uh, you know, groups are or many other countries are. So that's, to me, some of the contributing facts. But very interesting, I was in Norway a few years ago which is a country which is close to the top, and meeting with Ecocrim, which is their anti-corruption agency uh, in that country. And they had had a, um, a scandal in a local government. And, you know, they were quite surprised. And they said, well, if it can happen in this local government, maybe it can happen somewhere else. And they began to look and found that there was, at the local level, that there were many more problems than they realized they had. But they moved in, you know, they did the forensic audits, forensic audits, and they uh, brought in some of the remedies. In Canada right now, we have a, a major uh, commission of inquiry uh, for the city of Montreal uh, on collusion uh, in, in uh, construction. And it's, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of information coming out where it costed 30% more for construction of sidewalks and streets. We have a lot of those in Canada. So that's, you know, the kind of... In terms of e-government, uh, of course, um, there is no question that the technology today makes it easier to uh, move money quickly, uh, especially if the name changes of the owner along the way, where by three or four uh, changes, you don't know who the beneficial owner is anymore. That's why it's important to develop this right at the start. But at the same time, of course, I was using e-procurement as an example of the power of, of the web and how uh, Brazil was using it to uh, uh, offer the information without having to be mm. asked on their financial situation. And also, um, what happens is that the police, prosecutors, and even the judiciary, uh, Chief Justice, uh, have to increase the sophistication of the kind of people they have, but especially at the investigation level. And that's why I was very pleased to be involved in setting up the International Anti-Corruption Academy, which is to work with the people who are the practitioners and uh, help them to try to build the kind of sophistication to be able to use technology more and better in tracking uh, money's loss. So your point is, is very well taken. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, the question was, you know, what we're doing uh, at TI to prepare. Um, what, I mean, we, what we're doing is trying to see how to best use technology um, to reach out to the people. That's one aspect. Because we realize that we can work a lot with national governments, with the private sector, as we do. Now we know that the local level is a much bigger issue. It may not be here or in other Caribbean states, but certainly in large countries um, it is an, an issue. So we want to spend, we're spending much more time on that but also, uh, again, believing that people have to make the difference, and therefore in trying to re using technology to reach people directly, not only in terms of saying you got to say no, uh, but also to help them with tools in terms of how to engage with their local government, with their national government, and of working together in a constructive way. Yes, identify the problems, but then need to do something about it. Thank you very much, uh, Huguette. Uh, are there any other questions, comments? Yeah, uh, can I ask? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Laval, for the insight of the public sector corruption and the, the details.
but I would like Could you to stand so that, uh, yeah? Mm -hmm. I would like to touch on the private sector. In the developed world in the past five, six years, in the financial industry, LIBOR scandal, foreign exchange manipulation, and mortgage scandal, all these private sector, is it a corruption in the financial sector? Basically, the regulators you work for, Public Service Commission, get a penalty of $1.6 million billion from the banks. And it's drop off the corruption, uh, why, why that has happened and nothing has been published. What is, what's your view on that? Is it a financial sector corruption and is not handled properly? Or these are all in the developed world. It's in well, I think that the, the financial crisis demonstrated how, how important that sector is. And important in the sense of it created really a world earthquake with a lot of people uh, being the victims of it, losing pension funds, losing, uh, you know, employment, etc., cetera, et cetera. And And I'd like to go to a comment that Trevor made, not this evening, I don't know where Trevor, where Trevor is there, <laughs> about saying, you know, um, when we look at what has happened since then, um, regulations, some more regulations have been put in place, but there's been a lot of pushback. Uh, billions have been spent uh, pushing back uh, against regulation in the United States alone. Um, that's one aspect. Uh, secondly, there's been major fines. I mean, billions of dollars have been paid in fines, but there are not too many people that landed in jail so far, mm -hmm. if any. And therefore, um, I think that this is not a sector which one has to say it's been fixed. We can move on. Um, it has not been totally fixed, far from it. Okay. I just want to indicate that uh, we were due to adjourn at 7.45. It's now 20 minutes past eight, and you're showing extraordinary patience, attentiveness, and interest but I don't want to test your patience beyond that which is appropriate. So we're going to take two or three more comments, questions, and then um, adjourn until tomorrow morning. A gentleman, yeah? I, my name is Paul Miller, and I'm professor of education at Brunel University in London. And Dr. LaBelle, you spoke about um, education as being important in the fight against corruption. But research within the last two decades has indicated that there is a lot of corruption in education in terms of persons putting forward false qualifications, some rigging of examination results, some corruption in recruitment and promotion practices. What advice then do you have for education as a, as a field? Um, we could have quite a uh, a symposium on some of the problems uh, in education. You've identified a number of them, uh, of course. And in some countries, uh, on top of your tuition, um, you have to pay up to $10,000 sometimes under the table to be able to enter the university. Then to get the, it doesn't finish there, to get the marks, to get the diploma. Um, so uh, it's good that it's not the norm, but, that's, but there's many other more subtle aspects and you've identified a number of them and you know you can teach ethics to students in engineering or in the MBA program but if the same students see the institution being corrupt then they won't you know you're not doing much right? so uh, I think that um, uh, what is important is uh, for each university each college if I'm looking at the higher level um, to really, um, this, you know, from the top, to start with appointing the kinds of presidents um, that will believe that their institution is, is going to become the most ethical in that country and in the world. And to really work, build a team, which is, so, you know, it starts there, but it doesn't end there. It's the same, and, you know, the deans have to do exactly the same thing. 
and to really have a much more open to, I mean, whenever I was in the government, for example, I had a yearly uh, all-employee survey, and the questions were developed with the employees on, on the institution, all aspects of it. And I think in universities, there is some of that, but very often the students don't have time, don't know if you're looking at student surveys. Um, and, but if you have you know, a good ombudsman in the institution so that people can go with complaints, if you have that strong leadership at the top, which is translated at the dean level, others, and that when professors are hired, that right from that day, they are hired under a number of assumptions. And that if they're not ready to live by those assumptions, they're not welcomed in that institution. Uh, so, you know, I'm just using a few examples, and I'm sure those of you uh, who are in universities would probably have many more uh, than this. But I was chancellor of the University of Ottawa for 18 years. That's the nice job. You don't get paid, but, uh, you know, it's easier. Uh, but the buck stops there if something goes wrong. And um, I, was, I was very interested. We started, you know, having an ombudsman at that time. But we had a professor, which became a big case, uh, in, who was teaching quantum physics. That was his course. But he decided that what he was going to teach instead was how to be young activists and do something, you know, shake the world. The only problem is that the people who would hire these students or these graduates would expect them to know about quantum physics. Uh, not about being activists in the world. They could go and do something, you know. And uh, so uh, he was warned, and then he decided that he would give full marks to all his students as long as they came to class. So he was fired after several warnings, took it to court, etc., and he lost. But uh, I guess my point here is that when you have, a, and, and the students, the other students began to complain because they were seeing what was happening. And the students who wanted to, be, to live fairly and be part of an institution which was strong and graduates that were recognized didn't want that sort of thing to happen. So the open system, I think, does help as well. I think we take one more. Yeah. My name is uh, Eugene Otuonye, and I'm the director of the Tox and Caicos Island Integrity Commission. Um, we've been uh, in existence for the past three years or so, uh, but we have been on our toes since then, um, extremely active, because we came into existence out of extraordinary circumstances. Um, just a point, I, a matter that arose while I had left TCI to come to this place. And, and it bothered me so much and has a lot to do with cooperating with each other. Um, I, I had planned for one or two of my officers to go on attachment to an anti-corruption agency that we consider to be have much of best practice because they have been existing for quite a while. And I had to do that because we, we've been firefighting all along. And things seem to have quieted down slightly. And I thought that I could send them out, my officers one after the other, on attachment. And I left. I asked him to follow up with that. So while I was here, uh, with all the enthusiasm bubbling in me, in terms of the kind of global gathering that we see here, um, I got a reply from the anti-corruption agency that they do not have facilities for attachment. And that this attachment is supposed to be paid by my office, going and coming, hotel, everything. Just share a bit of your experience with my officer. Uh, open up a little bit, the much that you can, so that he will come back better equipped. And with that kind of reply, I felt really deflected. And I thought I could share this here 
because you just cannot fight it alone. No matter the successes that you have recorded in your anti-corruption agency, you just cannot. You might be surprised that on your own, eventually you are not going to make it. It might be important for all of us to cooperate because it is a global, a global scourge that needs to be fought jointly, frantically, drastically, however we want to approach it. But we need to help each other. And you may not and cannot be an island to yourself, no matter how well you are doing with your organization. And Dr. Labelle, I think I got excited when you mentioned the Anti-Corruption International Agency, the Academy. And I was just saying, OK, if any of our colleagues or the organization will not help me, I might as well come to you for the academy, whatever the academy will provide. And I think other organizations uh, and institutions may benefit from that. I mean, rather than, you know, depending so much on the whims and caprices of, you know, your, your colleagues' organization. 